Hello, and welcome to my newest beginning engineers video. Today, I'm going to be talking about time and motion studies, which is how you set the expected operation times in manufacturing or the service industry. It's also important that we talk about avoiding annoying those being timed. Time and motion studies are one of the fundamental tools and job tasks of industrial engineers. They're often just called time studies in the industry. Briefly looking back on their history, they were pioneered by Frederick Winslow Taylor. He's one of the fathers of industrial engineering. He's known for scientific management, which is all about increasing efficiencies and output using measurements. He did the time study part of a time and motion study. Then you have Frank and Lillian Gilbreth, a married couple. They really focused on breaking down the motions that people do into very small distinct parts. They call these distinct standard motions Thurbligs, which is pretty much their last name backwards, and then they switch two of the letters, which is pretty neat. So if you discover something groundbreaking or really help the industry out, maybe you can name something after yourself. So I guess the question here is, can you really standardize the motion and time it takes to do a task? Yes, actually you can surprisingly well. I've done hundreds of time studies and they generally hold up. Once you time a few people and get a feel for how long it takes to do it, that should hold with the rest of the population. Now, of course, there are variances. We call these personal fatigue and delay factors, and you can use that factor to adjust the times. As I mentioned before with the Gilbreths and their Thurbligs, any complicated task can be broken down into a smaller, simpler set of movements called Thurbligs. There's an image on this slide that has an example of some of them. Here is a real life example of how we could break down an operation into simpler parts. Let's say putting shoes on. First, you would search for your shoes. Then you would find them. You would reach for them. You would grasp them so they're in your hands. You would transport your shoes to your feet. As funny as it sounds, you would then assemble shoes to feet, so that means you'd put the shoe on your feet. You would then search for the laces, find the laces, reach for them, grasp them, and assemble them. Now you might say, if a shoe's on your foot, do you really have to search for the laces? Yes, you do. It takes a split second, but you do spend some time looking for them. Now in all practicality, that searching for the laces time is probably negligible, but there's going to be some operations where the searching does take a decent amount of time. So in the end, it's up to you and your best judgment what really adds time to the operation. All right, so how do you actually do this for a living? Or even if you only need to do it a few times at work, how do you actually do it? Well, first of all, you have to make sure you have a clear physical set point that triggers each and every element. An element is just typically what we call a step in the industry. So your operation is made up of many steps. It's made up of many elements. So for example, I was working on a time study at a place that made coils, copper coils that went into solenoids eventually. The first element started by grabbing a string and wrapping that string around an arbor, a mechanical piece. Grabbing the string is not debatable. As soon as someone's hand touches the string, that's when you would start timing. It was very obvious. After the string was tied, they had to grab copper. So the trigger for that element was grab copper. And then the actual step was wrap the copper around the arbor. If you originally went into this observing the operator and said, step one, wrap the string and copper around the arbor you wouldn't know exactly when to start timing. When they're pulling on the string, when they're pulling on the copper, when it touched the mechanical thing they were wrapping it around, you don't want to leave any room for debate. So a lot of times grab or touches are perfect trigger points because it's something that everyone can agree on. As soon as you see something touch something else, start your timer. As you follow through with all your elements, your last step needs the lead back into the trigger point of your first step. In this case, it did. Touch the coil to the table and grab the string. 
And if you look back up at element one, it was triggered by grabbing the string. If this is not the case, then you don't have the full cycle. You're probably missing something. So double check your observations. Also be careful that the operators, the people you're timing, maybe if you're in the service industry, it's, you know, call help assistance. Be careful that they aren't deliberately going slow. This does take some experience though. If you're new at the place you're working at or haven't done a lot of time studies, you might not be able to tell they're going slow or not. So maybe ask a supervisor or just come back at multiple times. Hopefully they wouldn't fake it every single time you're around. And hopefully the culture of where you work doesn't really encourage that. But we'll talk more about that later. All right, so once you've done some observations and you've written down the trigger points and the element steps for each step in the cycle and your end step goes back to your beginning trigger point, you can begin to make your observations. And what's nice about a trigger point is as soon as you see that exact instant in time, you start your stopwatch. And then you take a time, you move on to the next element. You take that time, you move on to the next one. And with many jobs, they're repetitive. So eventually you get back to the beginning, you start again, so you get a second column of information, then a third, then a fourth, and you keep doing this till at least five or six observations. But if you're new to this, I'd recommend doing closer to 10. Then you sum up all your time in each row. So for each element, all your observations, you add up the time, and then you divide by the number of observations. So you get an average. And this is the best way to do it because multiple measurements, the more you take, the more you'll kind of zoom in on that actual element time, a more accurate element time. And that's just the law of large numbers. You do something over and over again, you get a better representation of what the actual number is. And once you get a time for each element, you can decide how long it will take to do the entire cycle. And then from here, you can say, okay, this many seconds per cycle or this many minutes, you'll get this many parts per hour. So you finally have some useful metrics for production. The last point I'll say is that industrial engineers typically use decimal minute watches for time studies. That's just because most decimal minute watches go out to the third decimal and minutes as opposed to seconds. That's just a lot easier for calculations and it's a lot more accurate of a time. Here's some other useful notes. Believe it or not, you might have wondered, okay, if I'm taking all these times, hasn't someone done this before? Possibly, yes, someone at your own company might have, so check to see if that information exists. But if not, there's actually even general standards that are in place. Um, one is called methods time measurement, for example. There's many different standards. A lot of companies have their own. You know, a reach should take this long for every foot, or an assembling this type of screw to this type of hole should take this long. There's a lot of that out there. As we mentioned earlier about people faking or being nervous with their times if you're around, the number one thing I would like to stress above all else, make sure you really speak to the people you are time studying before you just begin. They're people too. Build rapport and ask questions. Approach them and say, hi, I'm going to be doing a time study for this reason. It will never be used to punish you. Is that okay? I've had people thank me and tell me I was one of the first ones to actually approach them and ask them. And beyond being polite, it's just more effective that way too. You're going to get a lot more cooperative people who are less prone to fake. And as you begin these conversations, if they're more comfortable with you, they're going to tell you problems they're having or other areas you should investigate. So it will lead to additional things to study and collect information on. As I mentioned before, how everyone takes a little bit of different time compared to one another. Even with very easy tasks, people vary. Some people are speed demons, some people are a little slower. Uh, so personal fatigue and delay factors are, are anywhere between 5 and 15%. You know, so you get a time and you can say, okay, well, you know, our company is a more laid back culture. Let's give them an extra 10% amount of time you know, just in case they need that bathroom break or they're feeling a little tired that day. That's a pretty standard practice. But likewise, too, if you're timing someone that's really quick all the time, you can add way more time. Or if you think someone's going slow on purpose, dial down the time a little bit. 
All right, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you subscribe to my channel, and above all else, I hope you really learned the value of time studies and how to perform them. It's really interesting once you begin collecting the data, because you can really begin to predict how long production should take. And you can even apply a lot of these numbers to different operations, as long as they're similar enough.